May it please the court, I appear on behalf of the appellants, together with my learned friends, Ms. Kazi and Ms. Weber. Thank you, Mr. Dodson. Uh, Chief Justice, I'm appearing for the second, uh, for the first and the second responder. Thank you. Thank you, Chief Justice. The court today hands down judgment in an application for leave to appeal against the judgment and order of the Supreme Court of Appeal. The case concerned the failure by the Department of Rural Development and Land Reform to process land tenant applications. Those applications were submitted in terms of the Land Reform Labor Tenants Act of 1996. Because of that failure, the Land Claims Court ordered the appointment of a special master for labor tenants to assist the department in its implementation of the Labor Tenants Act. The majority of the Supreme Court of Appeal, while affirming much of the order of the Land Claims Court, upheld the department's appeal against the special master's appointment. A secondary issue was a contempt application the, applica the applicants brought against the Minister of Rural Development and Land Reform. The Land Claims Court found that the applicants had not established that the Minister was in contempt of the order. The Supreme Court of Appeal unanimously dismissed the applicants' appeal against the Land Claims Court's exoneration of the Minister. The Labour Tenants Act is the legislation the Constitution envisages to realise the constitutional promise to provide security of tenure to labour tenants. Thousands of labour tenants, including the applicants before the court this morning, lodged applications with the department under the Act before the cut-off date of March 2001. However, the department failed to process these applications. Both the Land Claims Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal found that this failure by the department breached sections 10, section 25, 6, 33, 195 and 237 of the Constitution. The question was what to do about it. More particularly, the question was whether the order the Land Claims Court granted in appointing the Special Master constituted what the Appeal Court called a textbook case of judicial overreach. The dispute therefore rests on the extent of the Land Claims Court's power to fashion and implement remedies. The applicants are or represent labour tenants. They, are those, they or those they represent all occupy land on the Hilton College estate in KwaZulu-Natal. Their claims are representative of many thousands more. The Associ Association for Rural Advancement, AFRA, is the fifth applicant. It is an NGO founded in 1979. For the past 40 years, it has promoted land rights and agrarian reform with the object of redressing past injustices and improving the quality of life and livelihoods of rural people. The applicants all approached the Land Claims Court in July 2013 with their challenge to the Department's failure to process land tenant applications. These, those proceedings culminated in a judgment and order in December 2016 by Mr Acting Justice Nube. This ordered the appointment of a Special Master of Labour Tenants to assist the Court in monitoring the Director General and the Department. In the Supreme Court of Appeal, the Director General and the Minister appealed against the appointment of the Special Master. The majority judgment affirmed much of the Land Claims Court's approach and order, but it excised the heart of the relief that the Land Claims Court had granted, which was the Special Master. The Supreme Court of Appeal considered this concept of the Special Master an untimely and alien foreign import. It echoed a warning delivered in this court by our highly esteemed colleague, former colleague Justice Krichler, against the, the blithe adoption of alien concepts like the Special Master. The Supreme Court of Appeal thus found that the Land Claims Court had overreached its judicial role. The dissenting judgment in the Supreme Court of Appeal upheld 
the decision of the Land Claims Court to appoint the Special Master. The applicants, therefore, All this, the majority finds, shows that the mythical spell must be broken and the impasse must be resolved. And this can be done with cooperation, goodwill, humility and respect, and without necessarily adversarial combat between the courts and the department. The courts and government are not at odds about fulfilling the aspirations of the Constitution. And there is no rigid or static conception of strictly demarcated separation of power roles. The different branches of constitutional power all share a commitment to the Constitution's vision of justice, dignity and equality. The three branches of government are engaged in a shared enterprise of fulfilling practical constitutional promises to the country's most vulnerable people. It is true that these joint efforts will sometimes generate friction in cases that cry out for effective relief, however, tagging a function as administrative or executive, in contradistinction to judicial, need not always be decisive. For it is crises in governmental delivery and not the wish on the part of judges to exercise power that demands that the courts explore the limits of separation of, juris of powers jurisprudence. When egregious infringements have occurred, the courts have had little choice in their duty to provide effective relief. This was so in the unanimous judgment on behalf of this court by my colleague Justice Frunemann. It is also the case here that judgment was the Black Sash judgment, which is well known publicly. In both these cases, the most vulnerable and the most marginalized have suffered from insufficiency of governmental efficiency and delivery. The vulnerability of those who suffer most from these failures underscores how important it is for the courts to craft effective, just and equitable remedies. In cases of extreme rights infringement, the ultimate boundary lies where the court itself continues to control the remedy. If this requires temporary uh, supervised oversight of administration, where the bureaucracy has shown itself unable to perform, then there is little choice. It has to be done. In this case, the fact that the Department's tardiness and inefficiency in making land reform and restitution real has triggered what can rightly be called a constitutional near emergency. This underscores the need for practically effective judicial intervention. Through all times and issues, this Court has emphasized the importance of respect for the separated distribution of powers between legislature, executive, and judiciary, and it has enjoined restraint of judicial power. It has displayed it so much that many of its critics have on occasion reproved it for being too cautious. And the courts have never sought to supplant government. They step in only when persuaded that they have to protect rights infringed by insufficient and unreasonable conduct. In treatment action campaign, in which this court ordered uh, a previous government to start making antiretroviral treatment available, this court noted that where the state has failed to give effect to its constitutional duties, the constitution obliges the court to say so. And in that judgment, my colleagues present here today, Justices Goldstone, Mosaneke, and Sachs, and Krichler joined. In argument, in this case, the department did not contend that a special master could never be justified. It said there might be circumstances in which it was warranted. This would depend, counsel for it said, on the extent of the rights violations and of the bureaucratic dysfunction in not remedying them. The department contended only that the level of violation and dysfunction here was not extreme enough to justify a special master. This concession was sound. What we have to do is to undertake a careful consideration of where judicial power stops and with it the practical question as to when 
court intervention on this scale is justified. It is a mistake to classify the special master as an exotic or outlandish importation. The main warrant for the Land Claims Court's order was our own home-baked statutory powers. Comparative analyses and best practices are helpful in understanding the role of special master and they mitigate the notion that it is alien, but foreign jurisdictions have affirmed the powers, that, but the fact that they have affirmed the powers of special masters does not bind us in finding a South Africa-specific remedy here. This is especially so in the nationally imperative question of land reform and restitution. The Supreme Court of Appeals concerned that the special master might be designed to effectively usurp the functions of the Director General and the officials of the Department would have been better directed had the Land Claims Court appointed a much more intrusive official. Far from the Land Claims Court abdicating its own powers or usurping those of the Department, it set the scope of the Special Master's mandate itself and retained control over what the Special Master did at all stages. The Land Claims Court made clear that the Special Master remains an agent of the Court and that the independence that the Special Master would enjoy would be a function of its own independence. While it seems that the powers are intrusive, this is only because it is the court itself that is exercising the intrusion, the intrusion in the department. The court is stepping in to ensure that the nationally critical land reform and restitution process makes headway 20 years after it should. In this way, the special master's independence is a constitutionally enshrined project. The Land Claims Court located its power to uh, appoint the Special Master very much in its own statutory powers. And this court has held that the Land Claims Court enjoys the powers of the High Court in exploring its remedies. As my colleague Justice Madlanga eloquently reminded us in a case concerning the Electoral Commission, the outer limits of a remedy are bounded only by justice and equity. It may come in various shapes and forms, dictated by the many and varied manifestations of what kind of remedy may be called for. In that case, the court should be wary not to self-censor. It should do justice and afford an equitable remedy to those before it as it is empowered to do. In the view of the majority of this court, the Land Claims Court directed itself properly and scrupulously to the facts before it in appointing the special master. These showed failing institutional functionality of an extensive and sustained degree. That cried out for a remedy. In understanding the Land Claims Court's exercise of its discretionary powers, it identified the fundamental issues as institutional and not personal. The fate of the applicant's contempt application against the minister made the same point in a different way that this was not about personal obduracy, but about impairment in departmental function. A remedy of the kind that the Land Claims Court granted in this case was designed to fix persistent institutional failings that repeatedly resulted in non-compliance with court orders. It was directed to systemic functioning rather than to individual attitudes or failings. This diminishes any personal sting that the appointment of a special master may seem to imply. Instead, it recognizes our joint responsibility as a country for sustaining and growing and strengthening our institution. And it, it acknowledges our judicial complicity in institutional and systemic dysfunction that continues to impede our attainment of our shared constitutional aspirations and goals. For all these reasons, the majority concludes that the order that the Land Claims Court granted must be restored. On the question whether the Minister con con committed contempt of court, the majority comes to the same conclusion as the Land Claims Court and the Supreme Court of Appeal, that it is not possible on the affidavits before it, in which the Minister denied that he was acting in contempt of court, to infer that he acted in bad faith. 
A second judgment, largely concurring in the first, but differing on the ultimate power of the, of the special master, has been, has been penned by my colleague Justice Jafta, with Acting Justice Le Dwaba concurring. The, first, the second judgment concurs with the first judgment regarding the Land Claims Court's powers to appoint a special master, but disagrees with regard to the source of that power. The first judgment finds that when appointing the special master, the Land Claims Court was exercising its inherent power under Section 173 of the Constitution. The second judgment concludes that the court was exercising powers conferred by Section 172 of the Constitution. Those oblige a court to make a declaratory order pertaining to law conduct inconsistent with the Constitution and to make a suitable remedy. The second judgment finds that the power to make a declaratory order includes the power to issue a supervisory order. The second judgment also finds that the Land Claims Court expressly directed the Special Master to prepare and deliver a plan for the performance of the Director General's duties under, special, under specified sections of the Act at issue. These included determining the budget necessary to implement that plan. The second judgment found that this went too far. The question that arose for consideration was whether the supervisory jurisdiction, which forms part of the Section 172 power to grant mandatory relief, extends to cover the performance of what are intrinsically departmental functions, including preparing judgments. The second judgment finds that interference by the judiciary on matters that have budgetary implication has always been limited to deciding whether the plan adopted by the executive itself constitutes reasonable measures that the Constitution envisages. Thus, to the extent that the Land Claims Court's order authorized the Special Master to draw up the implementation plan that includes the budget, it went beyond the permissible bounds of judicial intervention. The second judgment would therefore have amended the order of the Land Claims Court to return the exercise of those powers to the Director General and to his staff. In the result, the following order is made. One, leave to appeal is granted. Two, the appeal by the applicants in the main application succeeds and the order of the Supreme Court of Appeal is set aside. In its place, there is substituted, the appeal is dismissed with costs. The respondents are to pay the costs in this court. The order granted by the Supreme Court of Appeal on the contempt application is set aside. In its place, there is substituted, the appeal is dismissed with no orders to costs. The appeal in this court against the dismissal of the contempt application is dismissed with no order as to costs. Chief Justice, I've just seen that we've omitted to give the costs of two counsel, although we say in the judgment itself that it should be two counsel as well. Uh, and I hereby pronounce that we add those costs. <laughs> We'll amend the, the particular printed form of the judgment before it's issued on, 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 in, on the internet. I hand down that judgment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that then marks the, the end of part A of our, of our program for the day, which is the formal sitting of the court. We move into the special session designed to celebrate the judicial life of Justice Cameron. And I begin by welcoming all of you and particularly uh, acknowledging the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Mayor Tandi Mudise the former Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic, Ndadiri Kham Seneke, the President of the Supreme Court of Appeal, who is also the President of the International Women Judges Association, uh, President Maya, the Honorable Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, 
Minister Ronald Lamola, Justices of the Constitutional Court serving and retired, Justices of the Supreme Court of Appeal, Judges President and Judges of the High Court and our Specialist Courts, and all of you distinguished South Africans in attendance. I greet you and welcome you all. I, I met Justice Cameron here. He became a judge of the Constitutional Court earlier in 2009 and Justices Kampepe, Jafta, Froneman and I only came in, I think, on the 12th of October 2009. But, to the best of my recollection, he is the only judge to invite me to his chambers during lunchtime <laughs> and fed me with something I had never known before. I was ashamed to ask on the first day and subsequently I said, what is that special meal that you shared with me? He said it was a, a spinach and feta chish. <laughs> <laughs> so bear with me, I'm a village boy. I had never been exposed to that delicacy before. And, and I made it a habit to buy it from time to time and real, until I realized that I was ballooning. Uh, faster than I should. Thank you for introducing me to Kish, uh, <laughs> Edwin. And just to make sure that I leave more than enough time for those who are to speak, these are the few remarks that I want to make. About four or five years ago, the office of the Chief Justice was approached by somebody from the presidency saying, why is it that there are no judges recognized as a matter of regu regularity whenever the national orders are uh, conferred upon distinguished South Africans? I said, well, it's not up to us to be positioning ourselves and profiling ourselves for for recognition. But there are a number of us who are more than deserving to receive that recognition. And I shared this with, with colleagues at our Wednesday meetings, which is known as conference. I said, what about the Kamu Seneke, who at a tender age sacrificed his life and went to Robben Island, just so that we can become what we are, a constitutional democracy, coupled with his distinguished career as a lawyer, as a political activist, and as a judge. I mentioned a number of names. I said, what about Sandy Lengobo, who has made a tremendous contribution to the development of our jurisprudence? What about Kate O'Regan? What about Yvonne Mokoro? I, I said, what about Zach Yacoub, who has been more than an inspiration? as a blind person going through his studies and ending up in the highest court in the land. Are you people not aware of these South Africans? But of all those who had retired, there's only one in active service that I mentioned. I said, have you thought of Edwin Cameron? A brave and bold man. When HIV and AIDS was or attracted stigma, he stood out and declared openly, I'm HIV positive. He knew the attitude of South Africans at the time because nobody had stepped out to prepare them that this is a condition like any other that requires medical attention. He could afford the antiretrovirals and therefore, like many of us, he could have chosen to mind his own business and care less about others. 
but, but not Edwin Cameron. He's not that type. He's never the kind that says, as long as I have my needs met, I'm not going to rock the boat. It really doesn't matter. Why should I tell people about my con condition at the, at, the, at the risk of being ridiculed? His love for the multitudes of South Africans and many across Africa and beyond could not allow him to shut up. So for the sake of those suffering masses, he not only spoke but he acted. He moved around and mobilized support for the needful to be done. Thanks to him and those who listen to him rather than mock him. The lives of many South Africans, the lives of many Africans, the lives of many people across the globe have been saved. Now people can boldly say, I have this condition, have yourself checked. You can be as athletic as Justice Cameron for many years to come. You can live a complete life. You still have so much more to contribute. Don't allow people to determine what is to become of you. So I said, that's the kind of man who deserves to be honored at the national level. Are you not aware of his contribution? I know that DM... Oh, I think <laughs> DM uh, stands for the Kamusenek, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I know that the Deputy Chief Justice uh, has been honored. But I'm sort of campaigning for you, Edwin. I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't expect anything from you. <laughs> but I think Edwin deserves to be recognized by this country for the critical role the catalytic role that he played in making antiretrovirals available to the multitudes in liberating many from the oppression that they, were thought, that they thought they were under as a consequence of just being in a, an unfortunate condition of uh, suffering HIV and AIDS. And finally, Edwin is not only a selfless person, he's also a humble person, and he is non-racialism epitomized. He is the epitome of non-racialism. Haven't you checked the company that he keeps? Didn't you see his uh, godsons? Do you have goddaughters as well? The many of them that attended our lunch yesterday, and I don't think they were all there. I think you've got a much greater role to play in contributing towards the proper deracialization of South Africa than you have. Something that I end up with, which I will state in the form of a parable. When racial incidents started to manifest in a rather too disturbing manner in South Africa, in the public space. I know that Justice Cameron visited one of the most influential, let me say, white politicians in our country to say if anybody can contribute towards coming down the situation, it is you. He went out of his way quietly. Not this thing of uh, TV cameras come, expect me. No, quietly. Why? Not so that he can be recognized for his contribution, but because the nation needed intervention and he wanted to <coughs> source in one of the key players who he believed could intervene, 
Um, I won't tell you what happened. I think he's best qualified um, to say what happened. So we have enjoyed this man as our colleague. He has an amazing capacity for anger management. I, I, I've seen him provoked. Um, and he is calm almost all the time. I think there's just one incident that almost escaped him, but he still managed it fairly well. So we'll miss you. Hopefully you'll come and uh, provide us all with quiche <laughs> in the not too distant uh, future. I think I'll pack it there and call the next, should I say, speaker. The first person to pay tribute to Justice Temeron Cameron is Mrs. Sapo Dias Dutton on behalf of uh, Mr. Timothy Dutton, CBE QC. Um, I, I assume that uh, Ms. Dutton will, uh, will, uh, provide, will explain who uh, the QC is. Over to you, Ms. Dutton. Chief Justice, Justices of the Court, Minister for Justice, Speaker of the National Assembly, and Justice Cameron. May I begin by saying what a privilege it is to be the first advocate of the Bar of England and Wales to be given the opportunity to make a speech to this court and to do so in honor of Mr. Justice Edwin Cameron. May I thank the Chief Justice for his generosity of spirit in giving this opportunity and to, my learn to me and to my learned junior, who, as the court may be aware, are close friends of Justice Cameron's. Sadly, I have been unable, as I would have wished, to deliver this speech in person. Fortunately, the oratory, as so often is the case, will be bettered by my learned junior. <laughs> she also happens to be marginally more beautiful than me. <laughs> it is impossible to do justice to the judicial career of so distinguished a man in a short valedictory speech, where any cursory search of him results in superlatives. I have decided that in order to attempt to capture the qualities and stature of a lifelong friend, that I should encapsulate the man thematically. There are five such areas. The first, scholarship and Herculean judgments. Justice Cameron's scholarship is legendary. We first met 43 years ago at Keeble College, Oxford, each of us in our second year. Justice Cameron had been reading classics, or greats as it was called at Oxford. He switched to law midway through the second year and therefore had to complete a full degree in five terms, where the rest of us had had the luxury of nine terms. Not only did Justice Cameron achieve a first-class degree, but it was one of the highest in the whole university. He went on to read for the BCL and marched to the Vinerian First, the highest distinction of the Bachelor of Civil Law degree in the university. These achievements, have never been matched since. I doubt that anyone will be able to reach these academic heights again. Through his unmatched brilliance, he enslaved and made lifelong friends with some of the great scholars at Oxford, the Regis Professor of Law, Tony Honore, as well as our tutor, Dr. Jim Harris. Edwin has spoken of inventing himself as a clever schoolboy at Pretoria Boys School. Of course, he worked prodigiously hard, but the cleverness was no invention. A massive capacity for hard work, combined with supreme intelligence, enabled him to advance beyond the reach of any of his peers. I will refer to only two judgments, as others will speak of, of his judgments, and it is hard to reflect the jurisprudence of a Dworkinian Herculean judge in a seven-minute speech. But it is appropriate under this heading to refer to the first of these, Glenister, a fabulous judgment 
which resonates internationally. At a time when many systems of law are hampered by odious, oppressive internal laws, Justice Cameron delivered a judgment in which he imported an international instrument directly into domestic law. This is a great, innovative, and brilliant judgment. More importantly, it brings hope that judges of apex courts in other jurisdictions will follow his example. Second, heroism and courage. In a review of Justice Cameron's first book, Witness to AIDS, President Nelson Mandela described him as one of South Africa's new heroes. At the book launch which followed in England, Sir Sidney Kentridge made this remark, I do not understand why Nelson considered the heroism to be so geographically confined. Sir Sidney was right. Edwin Cameron's heroism extends far beyond these shores and has been acknowledged in the many international laudatory awards showered up by, on him by other nations. Courage requires the ability to put oneself at risk, even mortal risk, for the benefit of others. The courage of Justice Cameron has two aspects to it. There is the public aspect which manifested itself early. At Oxford, he endured the spying of Boss to try to set up scholarships for non-white Africans. There were other aspects to this public courage. He came out as a gay man, and whilst his application to this court was pending, he publicly declared his HIV status. This public courage reached its apogee in the great speech at the Durban AIDS Conference in the year 2000, when Justice Cameron took on the pharmaceutical companies for their iniquitous pricing of antiretroviral drugs. In a lifetime full of courageous battles, this was the most significant. It was the beginning of the battle to make life-saving drugs available to the voiceless and the disadvantaged. There is also the flip side of public courage, which is private. This, to me, is wholly poignant. In his early 30s, while many gay men were dying gruesome deaths from AIDS, Justice Cameron was diagnosed with what was then a terminal disease. He faced down this diagnosis courageously, working hard throughout, first becoming a professor at Witwatersrand, and then ascending the heights of the courts until he reached this great apex court. The private anguish of the diagnosis was turned through courage into a story of triumph. Third, humility and kindness. In England, not long after a judge has been appointed, particularly to the higher echelons of the judiciary, an illness known as judgitis develops. <laughs> Those suffering from this disease, and I regret to say there are numerous in England, become increasingly deaf to the entreaties of litigants and advocates. They become opinionated and grand. However, in the case of Justice Cameron, the qualities of humility and kindness inform his bearing and decision-making and are part of his inner fabric. He will, in private conversation, listen intently and without interruption to what is being said. In court, he will do likewise, often assisting the advocate better to formulate his or her own submission. This brings me to the second and little-cited case of Justice Cameron's when he sat in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Most of us who saw the film Sotsi were devastated by its bleak and hopeless concluding section. In the SCA, Justice Cameron, with his unsurpassed humility and kindness, quietly altered its end in real life by giving Sotsi a second chance. Reading Justice Cameron's judgments chronologically, it is easy to see that utilitarian jurisprudence was jettisoned early by him in favor of the more complex theory of Rawlsian justice as enunciated in the fairness principle. Kindness, tolerance, and fairness are virtues that exemplify Justice Cameron. Fourth, empathy and love. Justice Cameron's childhood was not privileged. He grew up from the age of five in a children's home. He has never spoken of the deprivations he suffered, so one does not know how deep his pain is. 
But the, that experience honed in Justice Cameron the unsurpassed ability to empathize with those who are underprivileged, those who are unloved, and those who are ill. He has a piercing and sometimes uncomfortable ability to reach into the heart of one's pain. But this excoriating experience is always alleviated by the empathy which follows. In speaking of Justice Cameron's life, no speech is complete without an acknowledgement of one important contribution. In every great man's life, even one who is a great gay man, there stands behind him a great woman. This woman in Justice Cameron's life sacrificed her teenage years to go out to work in order to pay for his school fees and to take him out of the orphanage. She was a child herself, but she did everything she could to pay for his education and to provide a family home and love. She has remained a steadfast and unswerving source of love in the life of Justice Cameron. That woman is, of course, Justice Cameron, Cameron's sister, Jeannie Richter. And so, I come to Justice Cameron's last quality. What is it, we ask ourselves? This courtroom is packed with people who, if asked what their connection to Justice Cameron is, will say that he is their closest friend. <laughs> that, Edwin Cameron, is your special gift. By fixing your eyes on each one of us, you make us feel that there is no other person in your life who matters. This is the quality of stardust. We come to this courtroom or anywhere else you invite us in the faint, expectant hope that in your celestial presence, some of your stardust will rub off and settle on one of us mere mortals. <laughs> Finally, at this point, good wishes should follow for whatever Justice Cameron does in retired life. In his case, such good wishes are redundant. For whatever he does, he will do exceptionally well. Professor David uh, Bilchitz, five minutes. Chief Justice, dignitaries, and especially Justice Cameron. This disease will be the end of many of us, but not nearly all, and the dead will be commemorated and will struggle on with the living, and we are not going away. We won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. By now, you are fabulous creatures, each and every one, and I bless you. More life. The great work begins. I begin with these final moving words by Pryor, one of the chief protagonists in the play Angels in America, as they encapsulate for me very much the contribution that Justice Edwin Cameron has made to my own life and that of thousands, if not millions, of South Africans. As a young religious Jewish boy struggling with my same-sex sexuality and growing up in apartheid South Africa, what seemed to lie ahead of me was a secret life in the shadows of being perhaps an unapprehended felon, as Justice Cameron very aptly described it in his inaugural lecture as a professor at Wits University. Yet that very academic intervention, together with his tireless campaigning, together with a number of iconic activists, helped create an alternative future, one in which sexual orientation was officially recognized in our Constitution as a protected characteristic, on the basis of which neither the state nor private bodies 
could discriminate. Justice Cameron asserted strongly the value of the dignity for lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and all other kinds of queer people, that we are citizens worthy of equal concern and respect, a reality that this very court has helped to bring about from the decriminalization of sodomy to the recognition of same-sex marriage. In the same closing speech of Angels in America, Pryor speaks about a fountain in Jerusalem named Bethesda, in whose waters all who were sick were healed. The fountain had run dry, but Pryor thinks of a time when the waters will flow again. After centuries of sickness, South Africa needs the healing waters of Bethesda. Justice Cameron has sought to provide very concretely both physical and psychological healing to many people scarred in our country. He has also known the fear of death hanging over him and bravely chose to disclose his HIV positive status despite his own personal struggles that he documented so movingly in his book, Witness to AIDS. He did not do so for any personal gain, but in the hope of finding a way to ensure that millions of South Africans were able to shed the psychological stigma of HIV AIDS. And as the Chief Justice has mentioned, he also has strongly advocated for the millions of South Africans living with this disease to be able to gain access to the life-saving treatment that at one time was denied to them by our government. In this quest, he came together, he has together with organizations like the Treatment Action Campaign helped to save millions of lives and bring healing waters to our country. Justice Cameron's concern for every individual is not bounded by race or gender, by religion or class, or indeed whether one holds South African citizenship or not. His compassion is so extensive that it goes beyond the human species too. In a case dealing with animal cruelty during his time at the Supreme Court of Appeal, Justice Cameron was prepared to recognize that non-human animals are deserving of protection because they are sentient beings that are capable of suffering and of experiencing pain. In a precedent-setting judgment worldwide, this court built on these insights to recognize the intrinsic value to be attached to the lives of animals as individuals. Equality on the basis of sexual orientation, the right to health care, the intrinsic value of animals are just some of the facets of Edwin Cameron's massive contribution to the advancement of the law. These are some of the areas of my own academic research, which has been strongly enriched by his writings, judgments, and advocacy. Indeed, achieving rights involves, as Pryor suggests, great work. And Justice Cameron has been prepared to develop the institutions that can help achieve these goals. One of these is an institution of which I am the director, namely the South African Institute for Advanced Constitutional, Public, Human Rights and International Law, SIFAC in short. SIFAC was formed by Justice Laurie Ackerman of this court with the vision of creating a world-class research institute to generate original research relating to its areas of focus, engage with the work of the Constitutional Court and hopefully at times to inform it. We run conferences on cutting edge areas of the law every year and seek also to contribute to the advancement of fundamental rights and constitutionalism in our country and beyond our borders. In fact, next week we will hold a conference with over 20 papers that will be looking at the work of the Constitutional Court in the past two years and we will publish these in 2020 in the Constitutional Court Review Journal. Justice Cameron served from early on in the Institute's life as a trustee and in that capacity played a critical role in its transition from a standalone institution to its home as part of the University of Johannesburg. I have had the privilege to report to and engage with Justice Cameron in this capacity, and our interaction showed me another dimension of this great judge and human being, someone who is also an institution builder, who combines both the capacity to determine an end goal with the practical ability to make the necessary adjustments to realize that goal. Justice Cameron recognizes the value of academic research in its own right and its ability to inform and guide practice. And on behalf of SIFAC, I want to thank Justice Cameron for his work in enabling it to continue and hope that he takes pride in the work that we are doing. 
The work Justice Cameron did for SIFAC is just a small part of the many institutions he has been part of building, and I want to pay tribute to the important role he has played not only as a judge, but in both academic life and civil society. In conclusion, a famous saying from my religious tradition states that it is not your duty to finish the work, but you are not free to desist from it. Edwin Cameron has been prepared with every fiber of his body to help South Africa advance towards a society where the dignity, equality, and freedom of all are respected. His contribution is immense, and I have no doubt there is more to come. In the words of Pryor, I wish you, Edwin, Justice Cameron, more life and tremendous quality of life in the years to come. Advocate Durance SC, five minutes, please. Chief Justice, Justice of the Constitutional Court, members of the judiciary, the Honourable Speaker of Parliament, the Minister of Justice, I greet you all. And uh, I, I'm thankful as AFT that we have been invited by this court to celebrate the life of Justice Edward Cameron. Justice Cameron, growing up in apartheid South Africa, we knew of your presence. We didn't know you, but we knew of your presence. And so when I came to the bar and encountered you, I felt your presence. And your presence is a clear embodiment of the founding values of the Constitution. You are always fair, but also pleasant. But, Justice Cameron, we all fear the curveball and the pointed legal question that you would throw at us. And I just wish to read what my learned junior Musa says on this, on, this, on this call. He says, when we tell our colleagues that we're appearing in the Constitutional Court, this is the question that will come from the corridors. I hope you are thoroughly prepared for the likes of Edwin Cameron because he will hit you with a curveball or very pointed legal question. You really need to be on top of your things if you don't want to be made a fool of yourself. He is just, sorry, he is fast and always on the ball. That's why the law clerks name him Fast Eddie. So I don't hope I've broken any protocols, broken any secrets, but I apologize, but I assume that when it comes from Musa, that uh, it is sanctioned. <laughs> Justice Cameron, I was on the receiving end, and I think I had the dis discomfort of being uh, on the receiving end of uh, simultaneously the curveball and the pointed legal question. I was led by my leader, Mr. Uh, Tim Brainers, SEYCs at the back, in the matter called Twelopilo Nonprofit Organization versus the city of Chuane. We were for the city of Chuane. It was a point, it was a debate whether the mandament of Spoli had to be developed in line with the common law. Um, the judgment, uh, let me rather just say this, Justice Cameron, I was so afraid of the Supreme Court of Appeal just because of your presence. Because that's the day we felt your presence, although we were aware of it. I was petrified that on that day I will be slaughtered for, um, for the conduct of our clients. But, Justice Cameron, I can assure you, when we left, our robes were not on fire. But when the judgment came out, we were burnt. <laughs> Justice Cameron, I wish to deliver two messages to you. One is from Edward Patrick Umchalana Essi. He's our former leader. He's now retired, since retired in December. He apologizes for not being present. He says that you admitted him when he was an attorney you on the bench. You had given him sound advice, which he continued to use throughout his career as a junior, and especially as a silk. And the second message is from your former clerk, Musa, who was also my learned junior, together with Mr. Rauji. He's sitting at the back. He says these things to you. He says, although you are a towering, intimidating presence, you are also a comforting presence, a caring and loving person, 
and most of all, an inspiring person who's easy to engage with and it doesn't matter what the person's background is or what their social standing is, you always take the time to listen and engage with that person. You are an honest and straightforward person. You are truly a stand-up guy. Justice Cameron, as AFT, we are grateful for everything that you've done for this country, especially the transformation of the legal profession and society in general. Your judgments, you would recall at the la at when you were honored at the, by the Johannesburg Society of Advocates, you had, you had related a, a story that a young uh, student had complained about the length of your judgments. We don't complain about the length of those judgments, Justice Cameron, it was very uh, rewarding, very um, academically enlightening. We got to know you through those judgments. We got to know how the Constitution worked through those judgments. So as AFT, we say to you, we claim that we know you. In conclusion, I wish to say, a great lawyer, a sort of good lawyer knows the law. A great lawyer knows us, Justice Edward Cameron. Thank you. <laughs> That was Advocate Durance on behalf of, the, of Advocates for Transformation. And next is Mr. Mvusonokesi on behalf of the National, Democratic, National Association of Democratic no Lawyers, Nadel, and the LSSA. The Honorable Chief Justice, former Deputy Chief Justice Tehan Moussenek, President of the SCA, Justices of the Concord, Judges, of the judges present, present here, I must greet you, Justice Krichla, Justice Sachs, and Justice Goldstone. Thank you. It's nice to see you once more again here. If anyone did not understand whatever I'm going to address, um, please, at your spare time, listen to the song of Miriam Makeba. Sorry, Letta Muli, the wife of Kefas Menya. The song is titled Not Yet Uhuru. Kaulani Amakamander. That is Break the Chains. And the second to that, please read the book of ESK Mkai, Ichala Lamawel. Um, <clears throat> I must acknowledge up front that Justice Cameroon is one of the most brilliant and intellectual legal minds this country has produced. I'm mindful in this conclusion that it has always been a temptation to undeservingly pronounce compliments such as brilliant, honorable, intelligent, and outstandingly without sharing any underlying basis for such huge honor, acknowledgement, and unretractable conclusions without one compromising and embarrassing one's integrity. Our history as a people is filled with a rich heroism, much of which remains, remains untold. We continue to live our lives oblivious to the splendid personal stories of our generations, of our own brothers, sisters, friends, and, and neighbors, the telling of which would only help to reveal the character of the people that can and must inspire ourselves and the society. The story and on the upbringing of Justice Cameron as outlined in his book, which includes the incarceration of his father for what would look to an ordinary person as an embarrassment, his mother's lack of means to support him, and that he spent much of his childhood in orphanage in Queenstown, must lead to one conclusion and only one, that he is a unique, strong, and exemplary character worth for all South Africans to draw strength and courage from. Your story of upbringing confirms to us that a shepherd stands to be a king, save for his own choices and determinations. This condition would have had an undesirable destiny for those who would succumb to moments of adversity and hopelessness. But, Chief Just but Justice Cameron defied all odds and progressed to, to become one of the top justices of South Africa's apex court. Mr. Justice Cameron, we must admit that it, turn, it turns out to be no surprise 
that when you had an opportunity to, to align yourself with the world of the privilege, exclusively determined with reference to color, you elected to rather align yourself with the quest for justice for all and thus embrace Ubuntu. You did not only embrace Ubuntu, you resolved to fight for justice, freedom, equality, and dignity for all. Your activism included the um, fight for detention of the, for those who were detained without trials confirms your commitment to the ideal of a free, liberated South Africa, where all enjoy equal human rights and freedoms. Your upbringing tells us that your choice was not an opportunistic decision, but a call that reflects your own personal rejection of oppression, suffering and pain inflicted on the defenseless, poor and vulnerable. Clearly, you must have been motivated by a desire for a truly transformed society founded on the values of human freedom and equal rights. Yours was a resolve for an equal society in which all share and benefit from the economic resources of the country. What a, self, a selfless sacrifice such as this. We believe that we are justified in our conclusion that indeed you are a wise and courageous man. Through your character, personal stories, and interaction with our people, you are honorable and indeed a man of integrity. You keep your undertakings and refuse to abandon the cause of our revolution. At the time of self-created controversies, you became bold enough to stand by the people which had always been your primary undertaking during the struggle for liberated South Africa. In particular, your public pronouncement about your status and the strong fight against homophobia confirms a truly liberated great mind and intelligentsia. The judgment you penned to which your colleagues agreed in Jordan and others, city of Chuan, metropolitan municipality and others, was consistent with an uncaptured revolutionary and human rights activist we know from Cameroon of 1986. That judgment removed one of the pertinent barriers in property acquisition. Also importantly, the judgment of Ruta is a reflective of a true revolutionary and human rights activist who stood tall and rejected oppression at a time when it was not fashionable to do so. Who knows, if it was not for this judgment, Mr. Ruta would have been condemned to death and yet a loss of life was imminent, subject to the intervention. We note that in our judgments, you discourage formalism which is characterized with technicalities that do no more in advancing the causes of our people and the longing for justice. Yours has been to dispense justice with full understanding of the injustice caused by the past and the resultant inequality of the arms to access to justice. You live with the undertaking that motivated you to champion the cause of the revolution. You refuse to be defined by your position of power, understanding that the position you hold puts you in no more important position than that of Jola in Kumbu or Khadebe at Mshengu in KZN. You remain a servant of the people. We learn from you that the conditions we find ourselves in can never determine our future. You told us that we have a duty to break the chains. You continue to summon us to heed the call by Letambuli when she says, Kaulani Amakamandera is not yet Uhuru, which literally means break the chains. Through your personal account, you instruct us as follows. It is up to us to break generational cases. When they say to you, it runs in your family, you tell them, you tell them, this is where it runs out. <laughs> Justice Cameron, you are a role model and a jurist who has molded South Africa's jurisprudence and society with great respect, honor, and dignity. In conclusion, we must highlight that you reflected with, you reflected with pain on those who seek to auction our country at the altar of their immediate personal gains and self-enrichment. It is regrettable that 25 years of our democratic rule is not yet Uhuru, as Letambuli cried out. We are, 
we are held hostage by the bondages of the past. We are enslaved by the actions of ourselves. We refuse to break the chains. Your message is clear. You leave, you leave us with one. Please, as you have demonstrated, Kaulani Amakamandela, Itubal Figil. Then, as I resume my seat, let me refer you to what ESK Mkari records when he talked to the soldiers who had just returned in a war. Kotukani Ningalali, Kuza Kutengiswangani, Ngoisho. Return home, but lay awake because your father shall betray you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sigogo, on behalf of the Black Lawyers Association, I'm still, I'm still pleading for five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Chief Justice. The Honorable Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, allow me to recognize you. The Honorable Speaker of Parliament, the Minister of Justice, Justices of this court, uh, current and past, all members of the judiciary who are here, I all recognize you. The reason why we are here, Chief Justice, we are coming to pay homage to one of our own. And in my talk, if I was to give it a topic, I will say Justice Edwin Cameron, the epitome of openness and transparency. Honorable Chief Justice, I am honored on behalf of the Black Lives Association to be amongst the people who are paying homage to Honorable Justice Cameron in, in ceremonial session marking his retirement from active duties as a justice of this honorable court and in recognition of the selfless service that he rendered to our beautiful country, South Africa. Chief Justice, we are here today because Justice Cameron played a very important role in developing and shaping our jurisprudence as an academic <coughs> legal practitioner, judge of both the High Court and the Supreme Court, as well as justice of this honorable court. He did all this despite the fact that he comes from a very humble family, a family which qualifies to be classified as poor. Against all odds, he managed to rise within the ranks of the legal profession until he presided in the highest court in our country. In this and other courts, he, presid he presided over, he earned himself deep respect from his peers as well as legal practitioners, and this is why others call him a jurist in a class of his own. Justice Cameroon, throughout his legal career, was connected to the people. He was an academic and a professor at the Vest University where he produced many other jurists. He was a human rights lawyer attached to the Center for Applied Studies at Vets. In this position, he dealt with real problems, real legal problems affecting real pro people. He played his share towards liberation of our country as he used his legal skills and knowledge to represent members of the liberation movements, the ANC in particular, against the apartheid machinery. In your quest for justice, Justice Cameroon, you embrace the values of openness and transparency. We see this in many of your judgments and in your personal life. The case which comes at hand, the case of El Electronic Media Network Limited versus ETV, in this case you held the following. Hence, if accountability, responsi responsiveness and openness are fundamental to our constitution, then a consultation <coughs> process that lacks those attributes need to be explained. Where there is no explanation, there is no reason. And where there is no reason, there is arbitrariness and irrationality. Neither rocket science nor judicial conspiracy are needed to understand the explicity, logic, and yes, moral cessation of it. The story of your life that you shared with us is a true example of an epitome of openness. You revealed to us as a nation your personal circumstances at the time when it was not easy and fashionable to do so. You put openness ahead of your position 
in life because you believe that it is only through openness that our society will be saved of many ills that it is going through. You did not hide your passion to fight for the marginalized. You unashamedly stood strong and firm for the rights of the LGBT community in our society. As a human rights lawyer, you represented freedom fighters when it could bring harm to you and those next to you. You openly championed the fight against HIV and AIDS. Hence, we fully agree with you when you said, the stigma is still enormous. It would be helpful if we had more prominent people open about HIV positive. We are witnesses of what you stand for and you have been a champion of opening up. Only if we have more prominent people like you, South Africa, Africa and the world as a whole will be a better place. At the time you are stepping down from the bench, you are, leave, you are not leaving us empty handed. You are leaving us with a collective jurisprudential wisdom amassed over a, year, a period of 25 years and preserved in our law reports and other sources of our legal authorities. As a profession and as an organization, we cannot thank you enough for the wealth of the knowledge that you dedicated your life to accumulate only to impart to us. We wish you a well-deserved rest in your retirement from active position of a justice of the Constitutional Court. I thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Sigolo, for demonstrating that it's doable. You did it within five minutes. <laughs> Mrs. Lepu, on behalf of the Legal Practice Council. Uh, Honorable Chief Justice, the justices of the Constitutional Court, past and present, the Speaker of the National Assembly, our Minister of Justice, honorable members of the judiciary, learned colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Legal Practice Council, I feel honored and humbled to have been invited to this occasion to bid farewell to a self selfless man, a highly esteemed South African of whom we are all proud of. Justice Cameroon spent his whole life fighting for the rights and dignity of the most marginalized in our society. When it was not popular for a white man to stand up against the injustices of the past, he made his voice heard. Justice Cameroon had a choice to enjoy the privileges that came with his skin color, but he chose to look beyond the surroundings and wage the war against the injustices of the past. Early in his career as a lawyer, he displayed characteristics of a steward of justice. As a lawyer, you spoke loudly against the proponents of apartheid, and whilst lecturing at West University, you boldly criticized the proponents of the brutal regime, which had reduced and denied the majority of the South Africans their dignity and basic human rights. You, without fear or favor, the very judges who were applying the apartheid laws. Your actions at the time could have easily cost you your life, but true to your character, you continued to speak against the brutal regime and stood out in defense of justice and the majority of South Africans. There isn't anything I can say about you, Justice Cameroon, that hasn't been already said, and that is about to be said, my learned colleagues. But a person of your stature deserves as much praise as humanly possible on such an occasion. This country and the legal profession have, the, have been privileged to have had Justice Cameroon as one of the thought leaders who ushered into our current constitutional dispensation and beyond and it is no wonder that at the dawn of the, our de democracy in 1995, 1994, you were one of the esteemed jurists, and I was appointed as an acting judge. Our constitution has been lauded as one of the best in the world. 
with one of its distinguishing features being the entrenchment of all human rights, which includes the rights of the marginalized, the rights of the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender community, a feature that we owe to hold and vocal of our of citizens of our country, and we have the likes of you, Justice Cameroon, to thank for. You continued your commitment in speaking for the marginalized groups of this country and have been fundamental to the continued fight of equality for all South Africans. Justice Cameron, your judicial career, career has been nothing short of phenomenal. I will not attempt to discuss your many judgments as their continued authority in our law speak for themselves. I personally have not had the privilege of appearing before you and your esteemed colleagues in this honorable court. However, my learned colleagues who were more fortunate than I was always marveled at your thinking, your intense critical mind, and often described themselves as feeling abstract before you. I came across a talk the only time I could actually engage you, Justice Cameroon, it was through YouTube. I came across a talk you gave at the University of Johannesburg, and published on the 30th of June, 2015, titled My Career in Law. I marveled at how you explained in detail why the Constitutional Court is where it is. You showed your passion for our constitution and encourage the students to promote gender diversity, cultivate their sexual identity, and protect their femininity. You encourage the students and advise them to promote and fulfill their purpose by respecting each other's differences in whichever way they manifest. The legal pro profession must do more in spreading this gospel of gender diversity as you did to ensure the best possible future for our country. You are a true visionary of not only the legal, <coughs> but also the political landscape. Justice Cameroon, your, ju your judgments and written works have always seemed to be ahead of your time. The case that struck me most during my research is that of my vote counts, NPC versus the Speaker of the National Assembly and others. It was a 2015 constitutional, constitutional court decision. As early as 2015, your minority judgment was, had a significant, as early as 2015, your minority judgment contained the significant nuggets of the legal insight that you have being advantageous in resolving, that will have saved us from the dispute that we are now having between our sitting president and the public protector. You agreed with your colleagues that the Constitutional Court had jurisdiction to determine whether the information on private funding of political parties is information that is required to exercise the right to vote. You differed with your colleagues and maintain that, I quote, the differences between us concern whether form should prevail over substance when a litigant enforces a constitutional right. More importantly, it concerns the extent to which the court is duty bound to exercise an adjudicative power of the, the constitution explicitly confers on it. You maintain that the court had an exclusive jurisdiction under section 167 for, in brackets E, of the Constitution to determine whether Parliament has failed to fulfill its constitutional obligation imposed on it by our Constitution. Our country is seized with this debate today. Ordinary South Africans are becoming jurists. Everybody is trying to pronounce on these legal complex issues. Whilst the rest of the country continues to debate of who should be funding who and where do the money comes from, we should not lose the sight that the majority of our people 
yearn for real access to justice in this very court, and that was meant for that purpose. It is unfortunate that we should use you at the time when the judiciary is under intense scrutiny. Some may even say it is under attack. Be that it may, I am confident that the legacy you have left will carry it through. Your judgment remain, judgments remain a clear record that cannot be erased and will continue to set an example for honesty, integrity and justice. Your fierce determination in representing the marginalized community, his activism and academic works will all continue to inspire generations of legal practitioners to come. For this reason, I believe they are truly worthy of the title, the greatest legal mind of your generation. On behalf of the Legal Practice Council, legal practice, practitioners all over the country and myself, we thank you, we thank you for your generosity in contributing in, to the future of our country. As we bid you farewell, we wish you a long life and a well-deserved rest. Thank you. On behalf of the General Council of the Bar and the Johannesburg Society of Advocates, I call upon Advocate uh, Jeremy Gondlet, SC, a regular visitor here, who knows that five minutes means five minutes. <laughs> Chief Justice, Justices, honored guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the chairs of the General Council of the Bar and the Johannesburg Bar Council have asked my sister, Janelle and Gloko, and me to join this morning in the tributes to Justice Edwin Cameron. And I should pay immediate tribute to the hard assistance I've received in a tradition which would be known to you uh, from my colleague and also from our colleague Michael Tseli. However, what we wanted to say, Chief Justice, largely even before your diminishing guillotine, lies in ribbons because of the fullness of what has been said by many others in relation to personal attributes of Justice Cameron and particular aspects of his judicial career. We can't simply, as, as it were, the seventh respondent, the seventh speaker before you today, persist in simply saying what we would otherwise have said. We shall try to say what a few things which we think may not have been said or said quite as we would, with your permission, wish to say them. F firstly, Chief Justice, the, we see today the law in all its majesty applying a single section of a single act, one which in 18 years has never been challenged before you and which I venture to s predict will never be challenged, at least successfully, before you, although it is rumored to receive the daily scrutiny of every judge over breakfast. I refer, of course, to the Judges' Remuneration and Conditions of Employment Act 2001. <laughs> it is on this modest basis that Justice Cameron, good and faithful servant, at last receives a form of liberation. In fact, he could have left you earlier and it is his own sense of duty and what was right that has, that has kept him here. Today, with almost metronomic, Teutonic precision, he goes on the 25th anniversary of his becoming a judge. A decade served cumulatively in your court. He could have gone sooner, as I've indicated, but he has stayed with us all, and for that we would express our particular appreciation, well knowing personal sacrifices and the burdens that, that entails. Justice Cameron goes not because in the narrow sense he has attained what was memorably termed by the late Justice Neville Holmes in the appellate division as the age of statutory senility. <laughs> he escapes that, but he has the statutory entitlement to go, leave what is called active service 
but which to that which we can immediately all predict will not be, and the statute fortunately doesn't use the term, inactive service. Here present today are a number of colleagues who are no longer on active service, who have served and serve on commissions which are playing, have played and play a vital role in the public life of our country, as ombuds, as financial regulators, as judges elsewhere in the region. And there can be little doubt that today you will see, in seeing the departure of Justice Cameron, we'll see his departure not from public life and public service. His career is something which in its bones has not been drawn out as perhaps on an occasion like this it should be. He was a colleague of ours at the bar from 1983 to 1994. Already by that stage, he had managed to provoke at least two chief justices uh, and to be accused by one minister of justice of what we know to be the worst of all attributes, which is a lack of humility. <laughs> he had criticized them by writing articles, by feeling the need to speak freely, and we knew immediately that what was coming to the bar was a gifted intellectual troublemaker. And so fortunately it proved, because of the clarity of his thinking, his preparedness to take on cases. What they were is not something which can, in the time you allow me, be covered today. There are 17 reported decisions, uh, according to the database, in which he appeared alone in eight in the, the period of 1983 to 1994. Some are really significant. One I would mention because it has a significance in a moment was his appearance for the National Mine Workers Union. Another was a case which is remarkable at every level of law and human drama, Janssen van Vieren versus Krier, involving privacy, particularly in the setting of disclosure of HIV conditions. As a High Court judge, Justice Cameron served on the bench uh, from 1999 to, uh, to, to uh, sorry, he served on this bench while he was still a High Court judge from August 1999 to May 2000. Before that, had seen the most remarkable compression because within a period of three months at the end of his time at the bar, in August 1994, he became an acting judge. In September, his silk came through, and in December, he was appointed a judge. So one of the remote, most remarkably compressed passages to the beatified state of being a judge that one has probably ever seen. He was appointed to this bench by his uh, client in the National Union of Mine Workers position, risen to high office as President Motlante. He was in fact the only appointee to this court by President Motlante. When some windows are open, they are to be entered. <laughs> As I've said, one cannot survey the panoply of cases, and among them is, of course, the drudgery which Judge Cameron will be trying to forget today, but the number, the, 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 all the cases even of significance. 182 are reported under his name in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Uh, 186, and my colleague reminds me, plus one this morning, uh, <laughs> In, in, in this court, 20 in the High Court. His early work is something which might be forgotten, and earlier members of the court may remember his role, not always in penning judgments, but in those crucial earlier judgments in Darwood, in National Coalition for Gay and Lesbian Equality, for pharmaceutical equipment, the magisterial remaking of the place of constitutional administrative law by Justice Chask Chask Chaskelson and of course the Chief Lasapo uh, case. I must conclude, in doing so, 
I would want to say this about Justice Cameron as a judge, and here I do slightly repeat what has been said before, uh, that without failing, in my own experience, he's exhibited that Olympian, it does help to be tall, but that Olympian bearing sense of engagement but detachment. He has brought to bear the remarkable gifts of lucid thinking and exactitude of expression, which one of which is a blessing in a lifetime, but two are, are truly something which may be the stuff, the stuff of the stardust of which Sappho spoke earlier. Another aspect I must say in conclusion is this. It was said in the 17th century that no French nobleman had a valet who respected him. It might be thought the same about pupils, and one does in the normal way of the legal profession, which it will come as a shock to you know, to, to know is not impervious to gossip, <laughs> that ju judges are sometimes not remembered with affection for those who've had to work with them. In the case of Justice Cameron, there's the most remarkable fraternity and sorority of former clerks who speak of great gratitude, not simply for what they may have learnt in the process as they learn from many members of the court, but for his abiding interest in their lives, continued interest, and for that which I would have thought was beyond any call of duty is his unfailing attendance at all their charity drives. <laughs> as for Justice Cameron's legacy, well, one is reminded of when Henry Kissinger asked Cho En Lai what he thought was the contribution of the French Revolution to Chinese communism. And Cho En Lai said in 1973, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> what we do know is that those who speak with glib metaphors about every judgment that you've written being like a brick in the wall behind you. We all know it's not true, that at most there may be some stones, some illegible, but what I would like to suggest on behalf of the wider legal profession is that what you would leave as a legacy, as your colleagues have left before, is something far more imperceptible, which is an attitude of mind, a sense of application, a sense of doing your duty. And if ultimately that is all that remains and that hangs in this room almost like a fragrance, it is the greatest legacy that one can think to leave at all. Thank you, Chief Justice. Advocate Mukatla will speak on behalf of the National Prosecuting Authority. Greetings, Chief Justice. I come before this house bearing messages from more than 4,000 members of the National Prosecuting Authority. The bearer of the message, Chief Justice, is fully clothed today. You can see her with a shirt literally from a back of a little brother and a bib from a colleague. Well, the gown is mine. Esteemed members of the judiciary from all the court platforms, from the magistracy to the high courts, the Supreme Court of Appeal and the apex court of the Constitutional Court, colleagues in the legal fraternity, distinguished guests. Justice Cameron, a scholar, a friend, a doctor. And I would like to see that title more often than the one of justice because we know you already as Chief, as, as, I'm sorry, Chief Justice, <laughs> as Justice Cameron. I take from the words in your judgment delivered today 
I take the words overreached its judicial role. I take the words unreasonable conduct. I take the words where judicial power stops. I take the words where the conduct is inconsistent with the Constitution. The concept of separation of powers is better understood when you leave it. Chief Justice, through you, let me deliver the tribute to Justice Cameron. This message having come from 4,000 people and to consolidate it and put it in five minutes, it's very, very difficult. But we are deeply honored to send this message to you and saying a few words of appreciation and admiration as we gather here to bid farewell to you, Justice Cameron, an esteemed jurist as you embark on your retirement. You have served over 25 years as an upstanding member of the bench. Your journey, therefore, reflects the progression of justice in South Africa from your days as a human rights lawyer in the days of apartheid to the post-94 democracy. Long before it was fashionable, Justice Cameron, you boldly reflected on instances of the miscarriage of justice and the limits of the law and always exhibited a high standard of ethical conduct and demonstrated a very keen ability. The rule of law is shaped by the caliber of judges such as you, Justice Cameron. You have steadfastly defended the constitution of the country we've heard from the speakers before me. What a great human being you are. As an example of human rights activism, and using your upright standing in the judiciary to stand and fight for the rights of the downtrodden is one of your biggest contributions. Your gallant activism for HIV and AIDS and LGBTI rights was instrumental in putting the rights of the people affected by the disease that devastated the country at the forefront of the public and legal agenda. This reminds us that we may come a long way as a country and this fight for HIV, HIV, AIDS, and LGBTI rights is yet to be won. A new crop of activists that were inspired by a tenacious fight has emerged because you laid the firm foundation for them to take the fight further. As the NPA, we embrace the news of your retirement as it is a well-deserved one. You served the country very well. You have proved yourself to be the doyen of the legal fraternity, and we salute you. But over and above that, we have worked with you, we have been friends and patrons of institutions, and we are not that sad that we are going to lose you as an active member in the legal fraternity, but we will continue working together, and we shall be seeing you at those cocktail functions. You brought uniqueness, Justice Cameron, to the bench. You were always armored with compassion and humility. The Chief Justice has said that. This is a not a goodbye from us because wherever you are, your work will always be with us. You leave behind a legacy of wealth of jurisprudence that you've been part of establishing through the list of judgments that you have handed down both in the minority and the majority in the Constitutional Court, those will always be with us. As you graciously bow down from the bench, may your energy drive you towards finding other interesting and worthy causes of charity to stoke your passions. But saying this, we still believe that we will still carry on being with you as a legal mind is never lost. Again, as they say, a good mind is a terrible thing to waste. <clears throat> On behalf of all my colleagues at NPA, I convey our best wishes to you for your retirement. 
we will miss your compassion and humility that you brought to the bench. It was always a marvel to watch you as you dispensed law on various platforms armored with the values of compassion and humility. Your uniqueness and intellect will stay with us for a very, very long time. We wish you the best, Justice Cameron. Thank you, Advocate Mokhatla, that unlike the last time you appeared here, you dressed like a proper advocate. <laughs> it's now time for the Honorable Minister of Justice and Correctional Services, Mr. Ronald Lamola, to uh, pay tribute to Justice Cameron. Uh, Chief Justice uh, Hoeng Hoeng, Justices of the Concord, Justices of our Superior Courts, Judge Presidents of the various provincial divisions, former Deputy Chief Justice Tehang Seneca, former Justices of the Concord, the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, Mr. Ndimo Dise, all distinguished guests, uh, Justice Cameroon, in my previous life as a practicing attorney, my last uh, record case was on behalf of the Competition Commission versus Hoskins, and you ruled against the Competition Commission. <laughs> so, given that we've got retired judges here, maybe we can use that as an appeal court. <laughs> It is with sense profound humility that I have received the invite to participate in this very important occasion. On behalf of the government and the President of the Republic of South Africa, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, wherein we bid farewell to Justice Edwin Cameron after an illustrious career spending, spending many decades. I see the invite as a welcome gesture by the judiciary to, to me as a new Minister of Justice. We have heard the campaign, uh, Chief Justice, that judges need to be recognized before their contribution. I'm going to convey the message to the President. I'm glad to hear from many speakers before me that this occasion is not, is not only observed as a send-off to Judge Cameroon, who is retiring from active service as a justice of our apex court, but it's also used as an occasion to remind ourselves and the entire society about the progress we've made as a nation in the past 25 years. Judge Cameron, you have been a role model to many, including my own generation and those before me, both as a citizen of our country and as a jurist. With so many challenges in our country, I'm not sure, Justice Cameron, whether to bid you farewell or to welcome you to the list of judges that will be called upon for national duty from time to time. <laughs> for either in the Commission of Inquiry or other bodies of national importance. As the saying goes, judges do not retire as they will always be called upon. Sometimes retired judges become more busier than when they were in the bench. Ask your former colleague, uh, Dehang Museneke, <laughs> Justice Yvonne Mukoro, and many others. For sure, Ntate Museneke might be considering Lesotho citizenship. <laughs> A judge does not retire even in his death, as your judgment will speak for generations to come. They will be used for references even long after you have departed this planet by academics, by your courts, practitioners, and society as a whole. It is worse with you, as you are even an award-winning author. Generations to come will continue to imbue from your knowledge. In short, a judge make, makes rulings even from the grave. I have no doubt that with the contribution you have made to our jurisprudence, through the judgments and academic papers, you belong to a prestigious group of judges that will rule from the grave by reference. The Freedom Charter said, all must be equal before the law. The ANC is ready to govern, which was the ANC blueprint for governance before 1994, said the following. The rule of law guarantees equality for all. The primary duty of the state 
will be transformative, and the Bill of Rights will be enforced by an independent judiciary. This was before 1994, before we adopted the Constitution. So when President Mandela called you to the bench, he had, he had wanted you to make equality before the law a living reality for our people. He wanted you to translate the, the transformative ethos of our Constitution into tangible outcomes for the people. In other words, he wanted every South African to feel and touch the Constitution through your work in the bench. I hope in these past 25 years, from what all the colleagues have said, you have fulfilled this reality. You identified with the challenges facing the masses of, of our people, particularly the poor and the downtrodden, on various issues for workers, where you recognized the vulnerable workers of our country and represented them. You have also identified with HIV activists across the country. You have also identified with the LGBTI community. In short, there is no vulnerable group in South Africa that you did not play a role to advocate for their rights. And for that, you have made it a reality that lawyers are not just jurists, but they are social constructs who plays an important role in the reconstruction of any society. I have no doubt in my mind that had it not been for a fiercely independent judiciary, as envisaged by the ready to govern, that our fiscals would have been looted and depleted to a total collapse. Our country in the past few years might have become a fully-fledged failed state. Today our fiscals is severely constrained because of corruption and massive looting of the state coffers. Our economy is stagnant and unemployment is on the rise. I must thank you and your colleagues in the judiciary for stopping our country from a complete collapse. It came like a divine intervention, but the ready to govern had foreseen this, hence proclamation that the judiciary must be independent. Today, our hope to attract foreign direct investment hinges on an, in, on an independent judiciary, as rating agencies raise as one of the reasons for our attractiveness as an investment destination, an independent judiciary, and we will not be able to achieve economic growth without this important part of our economic life. You are a jurist with a strong political and social understanding. You have made many judgments, including judgments that relate to fair and freedom of speech. Often in moments like this, one is left with the question, what can we take away from such a distinguished individual? To my mind, Justice Cameron, is many of those judgments that have made independent speech and freedom of speech possible in our country. I want to say you did not descend to the politics of the day, but you did your job as a jurist. <coughs> Today, the judiciary has been criticized unfairly and in an unwarranted manner. We must condemn such kind of criticism, personal attacks to our judges, and some unwarranted, unfair criticism. Criticism to the judiciary must be fair, it must be informed, and it must be balanced. It must help society to be able to construct what the judiciary's role should be. And that criticism must help society to go forward. But unwarranted attack on the judiciary does not help society with any construction, and it must be condemned because it is may impute on the reputation of the well-established reputation of our judges and of our judicial system in this country. The, the, some of the minority judgments you have delivered have taught the public about the role of a minority judgment. They have taught the public that judges are also human beings. They agree and disagree on various issues. But also that a descending view must not be condemned but it must be looked at as an important contributor into our jurisprudence. The judgment you have just delivered on Mwelase reflect and is a standing rebuke on us as government on the land question. 
it has always been raised that the land debate in this country and also the implementation of some of the land issues have been found wanting. And what should we do as government to ensure that we fast track the land issue, which is an important national imperative? I think I've heard you clearly and with some of your colleagues. It is a message I'm going to send to cabinet tomorrow because I also have a slot to, 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 to update government on recent judgment. So this judgment, I've heard it live here. <laughs> so I will try to transmit the live and the kind of clarity you have tried to deliver this judgment with. And this is not the only judgment you have delivered on this important topic in our country. You have also delivered a judgment on Tombizodwa Mapango and others that related to a lease uh, uh, agreement. How must a leased agreement be enforced? In that, Justice Cameroon writing on behalf of the majority noted that the Act demands that ground for termination of a lease agreement must always be specified in the lease. But even where it is not specified, the Act requires that the ground of termination must not constitute an unfair practice. This might sound minute and small, but what has become clear in the current land debate is that the biggest challenge is urban land and people needing settlement in urban areas. So this becomes very important contributor into the debate of how the vulnerable may be able to access land and also places of settlement. The Socioeconomic Rights Institute, which represented the tenants in the matter, described this as a groundbreaking judgment. The Constitutional Court has affirmed the rights of tenants to challenge excessive rents and unfair lease termination. This is a very important contribution to the socio-economic challenges of our country. And this is not the only one. We have done so on many issues that affect the economy of our country and the socio-economic conditions of the most vulnerable. Of course, we are currently dealing with unemployment, low level of economic growth, and the various challenges, as I have said previously, we will not succeed to deal with all these issues if we do not have an independent judiciary, a rule of law that will enable us to attract foreign direct investment, will enable us to reduce the rate of unemployment in our country. There will be no economic growth without a rule of law. It's an important input into the South African society. I want to conclude. You will therefore be counted amongst the, the galaxy of stars whenever the history of our jurisprudence is narrated, amongst which are the late Dula Omar, the late Chief Justice Arthur Chakalsin, he is still alive, uh, Mr. Richard Goldstone, Justice Richard Goldstone, <laughs> the late former Chief Justice Pius Langa, and many other esteemed retired justices I don't know, uh, Justice Richard Goldstone, why we had to put you in line with all the departed. <laughs> but I think it's because you're a legend. <laughs> again, again, allow me to express my profound and humble gratitude at the participation in this very important event on behalf of the Department of Justice and the President of the Republic. I take this opportunity to, you, to wish you well in all your future endeavors. I salute. I now call upon the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, who has served for many years in the Judicial Service Commission in a capacity as the Chairperson of the NCOP and has again undertaken to serve in the JSC as Speaker of the National Assembly. Over to you, uh, Honorable Speaker, Metandi Modise. I thank you, Chief Justice, <laughs> Justices. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor for me, on behalf of Parliament, to say a few words to celebrate the life and service of Justice Edwin Cameron. 
The preamble of our constitution is inspirational. It says, we the people. And I always get goosebumps when I say that. Because at a particular point, the post-1994 generation would not understand it. There was no we the people. This country was in us and them. Our preamble also says, we respect those who have worked hard to build and develop our country. It says that we believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it. And it says we are united in our diversity. Chief Justice, today marks the 25th anniversary of Justice Cameron's appointment as a judge. And I suspect this was a very deliberate act of coincidence. <laughs> I am not sure whether it is another deliberate act or a mere act of coincidence that the Constitutional Court made this event to coincide with a remarkable and historical day, a Tuesday, the 20th of August 1940. For it was on this day that the then British Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, made the fourth of his famous wartime speeches, containing the line that said, never was so much owed by so many to so few. I make reference to this phrase because I believe, honestly so, that Justice Cameron is one of those few who have contributed so much to this, our young constitutional democracy. Chief Justice, we can never forget the horror of the killing of Gugu Lamini, a young woman who was stoned to death by people I suspect known to her in her own neighborhood in KwaZulu Natal. Her only sin was that she had spoken in her mother tongue in a radio in her home province and simply declared that she was HIV positive. We cannot forget the brutal and barbaric corrective rapes and murders which followed Google Lamin. And therefore, the calm and deliberate public stance by Justice Cameron to challenge the negative perceptions and stigmas around HIV and AIDS and around sexuality to stand alone in his field, to educate and to lead the battle against HIV and AIDS could not have come at a better time. That public stance, that public declaration, and him our respect and our admiration. Of course, the real beneficiaries of that stance of yours, Chief Justice, uh, Justice Cameron, were the faceless thousands of families who are affected by AIDS. That declaration eased the burden of secret pain. It helped lift shame and indignity brought by ignorance and fear in this country. Our nation could begin to breathe. Our nation could take another step forward after your activism. We agreed with former President Mandela when he hailed you, Justice Cameron, as one of South Africa's new heroes. New heroes because after 1994, we had a new battle in this country. We faced different challenges. The arsenal we used was different. It was words, it was education, it was the ability of South Africans to stand up one by one and to say, I'm also here and I'm standing for this right. So we think that uh, you are our hero, no longer so new, but a hero for South Africa nonetheless. Of course, we do acknowledge that some, some were whispering, were saying, ah, but why is he coming out? What was he thinking? Why is it coming out like that? We understood what you were thinking. 
when we started following the logic in your judgments in the various courts, we realized that you, Justice Cameron, was and still is an activist judge, an advocate for freedom of expression and association. Chief Justice, his judgment on the case of Holomisa versus the Agus newspapers was that uh, Holomisa had not been defamed by the papers printing that he'd been directly involved in infiltrating the Apla death squad into this country. What was important about the judgment was that it educated us, Jan Aleman, that media had a responsibility. They had to show the reasons why. They had to print, they had to publish, but they had to show that there was a reason, a good reason, and not malice to print their stories. That contributed to more uh, media freedom in this country. Justice Cameron also penned the Lika Bill judgment on the provincial um, legislative powers. Now, we, that is around 1998, you had a new president worried about a new constitution and the interpretation and the development of powers to provinces. And therefore, he completely balked at signing off this bill. It was the first since uh, the democratic elections to check for its constitutionality. Um, the Lika bill met, assisted, and gave guidance to parliament on the scope and ambit of the functional areas which are set out in schedules four and five of our constitution. In this matter, the court held that schedules four and five must be interpreted in the light of the model of the constitution and in the manner in which the constitution allocates the powers to the different spheres of government. So our whole intergovernmental relations, our whole cooperative governance regime is also centered on the clarity that we got out of the judgment. Now, from these two cases, I have understood that the courts became very, very active in the application of rights in appropriate situations depending on the rights in question. Ladies and gentlemen, the duty of a court is to do justice. It must do so exhibiting fairness, respect, and dignity to those who come before it. The judge, for lack of a better word, is a fulcrum on which our justice system balances. That justice system is a cornerstone of our democratic nation. Our democracy must never hesitate. It must rest on the rule of law. So our constitution is that bridge that must carry us from the injustices of the past to a society based on fundamental human rights, uniting us in our differences. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights recognizes that judges have the same rights as other citizens. They are entitled to freedom of expression, to belief, association, and assembly, provided that in exercising such rights, the judges shall always conduct themselves in a manner to preserve the dignity of their office as well as the impartiality and the independence of the judiciary. And I suspect, Justice Cameron, that all of us gathered here today can say that you have done all of this. You have contributed to the development of our democracy you have protected our constitution and therefore our freedom. Indeed, you have demonstrated commitment to the weak and the defenseless within the borders of South Africa. Enid Bagnold says that judges don't age. Time decorates them. <laughs> I agree. 
Stay ageless in your judgments, Judge. As Parliament, we wish you well, and we hope that you'll be able to catch up on all those things that you have had to postpone in your personal space while in the service of this country. I wish you a well earned and restful retirement. Really, Boch. Just so that I don't have to say anything except uh, we are Jen, let me just uh, make the following uh, concluding remarks before he speaks. I said earlier that Justice Cameron is a very humble man, but this is not the humility that is a consequence of some choreography. This is not professional humility. It's practical humility. Anybody who knows him would tell you of the, of the car that he drives. When government still had money, I remember trying to inject the sense of guilty in him because of the Toyota Volvo that he drives, saying, why have you, why have you decided to bring the judiciary into disrepute? <laughs> but Edwin, Edwin Cameron was not to be deterred. To look at his watch, look at his clothes, he knows that these things are there for a purpose. You, don't, you cannot be defined by what you drive or what you wear. So those of you, it is your service to humanity that must define you. So those of you who are overly worried about the current economic climate, and you're looking for a mentor in relation to how to use money, you've got him right. <laughs> it's an area of uh, era of cost-cutting measures, so you've got a mentor readily available. And secondly, it was not until Justice Cameron suggested that constitutional court justices must visit correctional facilities that it became a practice embarked upon without fail that justices of this court visit correctional facilities across the country. Why? He doesn't believe that we should ever find it possible to give up on any human being, regardless of where they may find themselves and why. He wanted us to see for ourselves what conditions the inmates live under whether there is any meaningful rehabilitation happening, so that flowing from the reports that we produce, not only the Ministry of Correctional Services, but the public as well can have access to reliable information as to exactly what is happening in our correctional facilities. So, Minister, if you do have a vacancy, for an, is, an inspector of uh, correctional facilities. <laughs> he is available, he'll be more than willing to do a sterling job because it is something closer to his heart. <laughs> Finally, you go to any country and interact with colleagues. I remember a number of justices from this court had two engagements with our colleagues in the, uh, the, in the Federal uh, Constitutional Court of Germany. The first question, uh, where is Justice Cameron? <laughs> Similarly, in Kenya, I went there. It was Cameron that they were asking about. Why? Because in his spare time, he makes it his business to share himself and his experience with many others out there whom he know do not have the benefit of the information that he has that can liberate them from the prejudices that um, that uh, have kept them um, have kept them in a position of disadvantage for a long time. So now I'm ushering to you a global figure of note. Those of you who watch television would have seen that recently he was even uh, interviewed within the chambers of the United Nations itself. That's Edwin Cameron 
uh, for you. Well done, my brother. Over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Chief Justice. Colleagues, guests, I thank you from my heart for your generosity in being here this morning and for what you have said. My overwhelming feeling, in fact, is one of gratitude. Gratitude to my family and loved ones, to my friends, my colleagues, my law clerks, and everyone here at court. I know many have adjusted their schedules to be here. In particular, I thank the Speaker of the National Assembly, Ms. Tandi Modise, and Minister for Justice and Constitutional Development, uh, Mr. Ronald Damola, for going out of their way for, to be here this morning and to participate. In addition, my heart friend, Ms. Sappho Dias Dutton, traveled overnight from London yesterday to ensure that she would be able to be here to read the tribute prepared by her husband, my friend Timothy Dutton QC, who is too severely ill to travel. And I thank you, Chief Justice, for granting Tim audience at a time when he still hoped to be able to come here. Your presence, Sappho, and Tim's tribute after more than 40 years of friendship strike an irremovably deep place in my heart. But most important, I feel gratitude for the encompassing and unconditional love that my family has given me. My sister Jeannie Richter, my niece Marlise Richter and her spouse Mark Lewis, and their baby Linda, who I think is trying to get to sleep there. <laughs> As you heard in Sappho's tribute, Jeannie helped make me the person that I am. Her family and their solid, granite-like love have been pillars of security and stability in my life. And I mention Jeannie's spouse, deceased in February this year, as well as her son and daughter-in-law, who are abroad at the, at the time. I also thank and honor Sophie Kakana and her family, who have been part of my family and I part of theirs since 1983, for their love over these years. I'm particularly glad, Chief Justice, that you countenance the presence of the two babies in court. I think Leo and Corsi Cohen is also here. Where is Leo? <coughs> there he is. I was hoping that they'd make more noise, but they didn't. <laughs> this, to my knowledge, is a first, but it's also right. I sometimes tell audiences of young people that our generation, Chief Justice, has had its chance and that what we are fighting for now in the work we do and the public advocacy that we engage in is not for our own futures, but for theirs. It pleases me to know that we in this court, the council here and everyone here, are fighting for the future of Linda and Leo and their futures. I also owe a special thank you to my partner, Ntlantla Mnisi. For Ntlantla, I have a very private question and then a very public confession. <laughs> the private question is, where were you for my first 62 years? <laughs> you have changed my, and enriched my life for the better so unimaginably that it is hard to conceive of how it was before you. But there is a public confession to follow. I know you think that our relationship since April 2015 was spontaneous and autonomous. It was not. <laughs> It was at the instance and under the stern instruction of perhaps the second most powerful person in this court after Chief Justice Kampepe, my, my, Chief Justice Mukwing. <laughs> my beloved sister Justice Kampepe. Justice Kampepe regularly admonished me about the absence from my life of a loving partner in fact, particularly a loving partner of Isi Nguni speaking origin. <laughs> when I say Nguni speaking, I'm of course distorting an important fact about Justice Kampepe, which is her proud membership as a prominent member of the Zulu royal family. She wanted a Zulu speaking partner. <laughs> but I think she has fully reconciled herself to the fact, Ntlantla, that you are Swati speaking and not 100% Zulu since the Amaswati and the Zulus are neighbors, cousins, and in many, many instances, brothers and sisters. Then to my colleagues in the High Court, the Supreme Court of Appeal, and finally in this court, 
Chief Justice Mukwing and my colleagues, I thank you from my heart. It has not been easy for any of us. This court sits on bank, and every judge is involved in deciding every matter that comes before it. That means that we are forced to deal with each other daily, often in mountains of emails and attachments. Over these 10 years that I've been here, the workload of the court has increased, Justice Minister, by between 400 and 600 percent. The pressures have at times been enormous, and the issues have been pressing, at times divisive, often emotional. When I started in this court in 2009, when the last of the judges appointed by President Mandela retired, of whom Justice Sachs is here this morning, I said to those colleagues that the first 15 years of the court had been easy years and that the difficult years lay ahead. I think that has proved true, not only in workload, but in political pressure and in the difficulty of the problems that this court has had to grapple with. In all these aspects, we have been challenged in fresh and unprecedented ways. Over this past decade, the still unresolved Flopez saga has hung, hung, has hung over the court. And in addition, we have confronted deeply divisive issues on race, including affirmative action, language rights, and culture. Landmark judgments in these years have ensured that public power remains subject to our constitutional values and the rule of law, and that public accountability is sustained. Through all of this, through all the difficulties, we worked hard as colleagues to try to find ways to fulfill our commitment to the Constitution while being truthful to our judicial oaths, but also respectful of each other. We did so, I believe, in a way that recognized the depth and complexity of the issues and the anger that they sometimes rightly trigger, but each time returning after division to renew our pledge to uphold the Constitution and its values for people like Leo and Corsi and Linda. In this, I do not think, Chief Justice, that any single one of us feels the slightest self-satisfaction, complacency or self-congratulation. Not at all. There's still much, too much to be done, and the perils confronting our country and the rule of law remain too large. If I predicted on joining this court that the preceding years were the easier ones, I fear I must make the same prediction now, that tough times lie ahead for those of us who are committed to democracy and to governance under law and to social justice for all people in our country and not the enrichment of an, of an inside elite. Since 2011, we have had the remarkable leadership of Chief Justice Mukwing Mukwing. His headship has been strong-willed, <laughs> insistent, clear-sighted, uncompromising, redoubtable in energy, determination, principled commitment, and insistent in the clarity and purity of his voice. He has advocated for truthful leadership against corruption, against dissemblance and lies, and for constitutional accountability. In other words, Chief Justice, you're a tough guy. <laughs> a very tough guy. Our still fragile democracy owes a very very considerable debt to you as an individual. And I pay homage to you this morning. <laughs> Minister Lamola, you said that you would be taking messages back to Cabinet. Please note that the Chief Justice's tenure will be ending in 26 months' time. Rumour has it that President Cyril Ramaphosa had better look out for you will surely be seeking a fit role for your post-judicial life. But if those rumors are true, what will former Deputy Chief Justice Dikhan Mosaneke do? <laughs> but before saying something about my law clerks, may I express my profound appreciation to all the staff of this court, the judges, secretaries, the registry and library staff headed by Mrs. Cheryl Latuli, the cleaners and the security personnel. You made working here a rich and companionable experience. And most centrally in all of this is my dearly treasured personal assistant, Elizabeth Metze Muloto.
Elizabeth started working with me on 11 October 2009 when the last of the Mandela appointees had to leave the court. She changed my life. She is an unexampled phenomenon of efficiency, lucidity, memory and sustained positive energy. Chief Justice, if you were not here, I would, run it, I would nominate Elizabeth to run the court. <laughs> Having mentioned my colleagues and the court personnel, I now have the very happy task of mentioning my law clerks. At present, they are Michelle Sitole, Sagwadi Mabunda, and Rebecca Gore. Since they spent most of the last two nights together with clerks from other chambers to get the judgment of this morning out, I think they deserve particular credit. When I came to the court more than 10 years ago, I'd never experienced close interaction with law clerks. The experience for me was entirely novel. It changed not just the way I work, but the way I think and the way I write, relate to people. I can truly say that the 30 or 40 years, the 30 or 40 law clerks that I've worked with, including foreign law clerk volunteers, have brought me almost unmitigated joy. They bring to the court not just their acuteness of intelligence and research capacity, but their ideas, and to pick up the idea of futurity, the fact that they look to the future, that they are future-seeking and always optimistic. However worrying the signals from our democracy and our economy, which Minister Lamola emphasized, how can we be down-spirited when the young people who energize this court remain so insistently talented, often brilliant, and completely upbeat, you have all been an inspiration. I started off, Chief Justice, by saying that my overwhelming feeling this morning is one of gratitude. My greatest gratitude, as has been indicated by a number of speakers, is of course in being here at all. I have survived an epidemic in which many millions of us in South Africa and Africa have perished. I have survived because of my privilege of place and protection and position. And I recall with pride that it was brave, principled civil society activists led by Zaki Ahmad, together with a vigilant, honest and truth-telling media, plus the judges of this court, led by Chief Justice Chaskelson and Deputy Chief Justice Pius and Konzolanga, who ensured that antiretroviral therapy would be available to all. A combination of principled, ang angry citizens and the rule of law, administered by honest and courageous judges. After nearly 11 years here, what strikes me as most enduring about this court is its commitment to the future, to our country's future, to a future for its young people. The AIDS treatment judgment was a judgment about government policy, but its most important effect was to look at the decades ahead and at the lives that had to be lived by those people who would not live them if they did not get treatment. Like all of this court's decisions, that decision was forward-looking. It affirmed our country's most vital energies and possibilities. As public values have been sometimes dimmed in the grim tissue of lies, deception and double-dealing through which our country has had to survive in the preceding decade, this court has continued to look forward and to look ahead. I remember the words of my colleague Mbuiseli Madlanga during our confidential discussions in one of the four big cases that opposition parties brought to this court during the tenure of the, of the current president's predecessor. He said during those discussions, and they're confidential, I'm breaching the, discussion, the confidentiality now, he said, I want our decision to be right, not for this president not for the next president, but for the president of my children's children. That, I believe, has been the fundamental commitment of every single one of my colleagues in this court, and it has been a privilege and a joy to share in service to it. A joy to serve in pursuit of their vision of the Constitution, one in which all our people will enjoy the basic necessities of a dignified life in an increasingly equal society in which injustice, racism, gender discrimination, homophobia, and xenophobia will recede. 
the fight for our constitutional values is now more urgent and ever than ever, and future-directed, future-regarding commitment is more vital than ever. If we sometimes shake our heads at, far, uh, at how far we feel from still achieving that reality, that does not mean that that reality continues to entice us, to beckon us on, to inspire us for all of our futures. Thank you very much. The Chief Justice has instructed me, you must cry. Thank you very much. Refreshments will be served in the foyer and the corrigence. Yeah, I'm going to go. How about you? Yeah, go. Yo, and